Live from the back of Ruth the Realtor's car, it's the Stacking Deed Show. I'm Ruth's neighbor and part-time mechanic, neighbor Doug, broadcasting live from the spacious, luxurious, super roomy trunk recording studio. On today's show, you've got to negotiate to get your best price, so who better to teach you that skill than auctioneer Dia Bondi? In our headlines, there was a huge federal real estate verdict handed down a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis. What happened and what does this have to do with building your real estate empire? Maybe a ton. Plus, we'll answer a Dieter question and don't you worry because we always save time for a property pop quiz. And now, two people who are the Da Vinci and Michelangelo of real estate podcasts. It's Joe and Crystal Hammond. Hey, Joe, I see you go by your first name now, Joe. I know, that just, just uh, Joe. Either that or my last name has changed to Hammond, too. Maybe I'm... Oh, Joe, Whoa, yes. it did sound like that, didn't yes. it? I didn't even yes. realize it when I when did I, that. Yeah. Is there like when a... I get married, the guy will take my last name. You're, you're premonitionizing that. I, I know one guy who did that. I know one guy oh. who did that. Took his wife's name, but it was a pretty sweet last name. It was Fitzgerald. Oh. I think Joe and I would have done that. If we had that option, I think Joe and I both would have done that. Well, if I can't change it to Hammond, then I would definitely change it to what Fitzgerald. about Kardashian? <laughs> I guess that is a segue. What names would you want? Winfrey? <laughs> I don't know, but I know what real estate address I'd want. Oh, huh? yeah. Huh? What zip code I'd want to be mm. in. I'd want to be in a really nice one. Exactly. And we're about to help people get there, Crystal, because... The Diabandi is joining us. She had a huge TED talk about her time spent messing around as an engin uh, engineer, <laughs> as an auctioneer, as an auctioneer. Maybe. Yes. So we'll have the engineer Crystal, the auctioneer Dia, the wild man Doug, and I <laughs> all together. I like you had to pause. Like, what? Uh, what adjective do I use for him? Got to come up with something. <laughs> That's Gotta, fitting. Kind of the mostly insane Doug. That's fitting. Yes. But a big headline first, Crystal. So let's get into that. Our headline comes to us from The Morning Brew. I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. Doug found this. <laughs> Doug's great. <laughs> I can't believe you said that out loud. <laughs> Two things we may never hear again. Joe, I'd like to talk to you about it. Right? <laughs> Major changes coming to the home buying process. And actually, this was all over the place, Crystal, as oh, you yeah. know. It says the U.S. real estate industry may never be the same. David Lozo wrote this piece and it starts off a federal judge in Missouri a couple of weeks ago found the National Association of Realtors and large brokerages conspired to keep commissions artificially high, finding them liable for, wait for this number, 1.8 billion with a B billion. in damages. That's crazy. They must have done something well, very, very wrong for 1 billion. And in another thing too, I hate that sometimes they do wrong and sometimes the fee is pennies compared to how much they scam people of. So they're like, oh, we'll happily pay the fee and nothing changes. Right. With uh, <laughs> credit card companies. I remember talking to Nick Clemens, formerly of Magnify Money, about this. And when he worked for Barclay, they had a line item, Crystal, that were for fees See? when they got caught. <laughs> Like it was a budget item. They knew they were cheating yep. and they put it right in the budget that once we get caught, we're just going to pay it out of this money we set aside. It was a joke. But this one, this one, you know, Crystal, this is the thing. I host also the Stacking Benjamins podcast. And over there, people talk all the time about, oh, you don't want to buy this fund because it has a half percent fee or you don't want to buy this fund because it's got three quarters of a percent fee. Agent commissions. Mm -hmm have been five to 6% forever, forever in real estate and nobody complains. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always like, real estate's awesome. How come you guys aren't bitching about the fees here? Like you are right. over stacking judgments. <laughs> like it's crazy how high these fees can be. So what it says happened is because the seller pays would pay the commission, the buyer could get in without a fee. The seller's motivated to get rid of the house, the seller, frankly, doesn't care what the fee is. Well, 
they care, but not as much as the buyer who might make it so they buy less house. Well, and when you're the seller, I feel like everybody hops on you with all the fees because you pay so many fees. Like when you look at that HUD statement at the closing, it's like, oh man, the seller pays for both commissions for the realtor. So they pay for the buyer's realtor and their seller's realtor. Well, those days are now over. There's going to be a new sheriff in town, I guess. They talk about what else might change. More flexibility for buyers because under the current system, sellers pay their commissions and that's shared with the buyer's agent. Sellers now, if they're banned from paying buyer's Mm -hmm. agents, then buyers would have to pay their own agent if they choose to use one, a flat fee or hourly rate. That crystal could drop these fees even more. That could. I think a lot of people also don't realize that the fees are negotiable. I've negotiated just to say, and that's why this is such a great headline to talk to Dia Bondi later about negotiating. But you can say, hey, I knew what house I wanted and, you know, your job was easy. Or you can negotiate with, right, like the how many homes you've seen. You can negotiate, you know, how easy, like, look, I've already come with my financing or this is a cash sale or this is no inspection. Like you can have different things in your tool belt to negotiate a lower commission. It's something that few people do and it's been right there forever. And now, now there's a good chance that we might see it even more. First time home buyers, they say could feel the crunch because now Crystal, those agent fees are going to come out of your pocket, could cost you more money. On the other side, if you decide to use nobody and go it alone as a first time home buyer, which people are going to do, we're going to have headlines forever, Crystal, as people just continually F this up. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> well that too because i know when i bought a place that was new construction and i didn't have a realtor i just knew i wanted to live there in that community the agent the seller's agent actually got a dual agent fee so even though she did nothing for me to help me find this place she got both commissions as the buyer and seller and so a lot of people don't know that when there's a dual agent when you're working alone then that seller's agent collects both commissions. And this would actually be amazing that, so the buyer, since we're coming in with no commission, that lowers the price by 3%. And that can be pretty significant. Significant? (laughs) (laughs) Hey guys, I have a little bit of a question on this. Here's what I've always understood about the way the commissions get distributed Mm -hmm. under what is now to be the old system is that if it were 6%, total. So $500,000 house, what is that? Like 30 grand or something like that in that range, high twenties. Anyway, so 3% of that goes to the seller's agent and their brokerage. 3% goes to the buyer's agent and their brokerage. And then they typically split it up so that each agent's getting one and a half percent and each agent's brokerages who they work for, whether, you know, it was whatever Sotheby's or Century 21 or Remax, they're getting 1.5%. Is that in fact, true and still the case? Yeah, technically, the realtor's commission goes to their broker. Some realtors are their own broker, so they don't have to split with a broker. But a lot of times when you go with the big guys, like if I'm a realtor with Remax and I'm just starting, Remax is going to keep 80% of my commission and I'll get like 20%. Like not that those numbers, but that's usually the split. But as the seller and the buyer, you don't care about any of that you know what amount is going to the broker. Right. But as a realtor, that's something that yeah. you need to know because now you know what percentage you're getting. So you are doing the work, but you are splitting that commission with your broker. Well, yeah. So then I just started thinking about playing the checkers game here because I'm not smart enough to play chess. <laughs> so are there going to be that many buyer's agents? Because if there's a good chance that the buyer's agent may not get that much money because you don't have to pay that side of it, will we be mostly just looking at listings and going straight to the seller's agent? I think we're definitely going to see the game change a bunch there. I think to your point, Doug, what, you know, cynical me thinks is going to happen. And I don't know your thoughts on this crystal, but I think a lot of people are going to go without agents because they're going to see how high the fee is for the first time ever. And they know they have to pay it. They won't pay it. They'll step in it hard they will <laughs> attempt to sue everybody for their own negligence because mm-hmm. they didn't get the proper help, right? It'll become headlines and there'll be this new industry that comes out of this that I think might be at a little bit lower fee, but will be, hey, you know, it's almost like how many times have we already in the course of less than a year talked about people 
not getting an yeah. inspection. Yeah. Right. People go, yeah, I'm going to cut a corner. I'm not going to get an inspection on the biggest thing you've ever bought. Yeah. You're not going to have it inspected. I think the same stuff's going to happen here. I don't know. What do you think, Crystal? Definitely. So the realtor has a huge value and that value is negotiating. The realtor knows the, the neighborhood better than you do. Probably. I think it's also the contracts too. Yeah. The, I think, the, I think the, the realtor contract. knows the in and out of that contract and knows when there's some fishy stuff going on. I remember looking at some of these contracts back when I was a financial planner, just because I told people, I'm like, I'm not a real estate mm -hmm. agent, but if you want one more set of eyes and I would read through it and I would bring up these clauses that my client had never seen. And sometimes the real estate pro had never seen. Yeah. yeah the, the addendums. addendums. The addendums are just different things that they add that's outside of your contract. And those can get fishy and tricky too. So your realtor speaks that language or, you know, the lawyer too, they speak that language. So I would definitely see a difference or it'll just be a difference in how that buyer's realtor is paid for. Because for me, as a landlord, I happily use a realtor to help me find renters. That's an expense that comes out of my pocket as the buyer, as the landlord. And a lot of people don't do that. They go at it alone, but then that makes your job harder. Just like if you're trying to buy a home without a realtor, that is just going to make your job harder. And so it'll come out of your pocket possibly, but that happens at the closing table and you'll get that 3% back in the power of the realtor and the negotiating mm. and what uh, yes. she's bringing there it he is. or she is bringing to the table for you. Well, that's further down this piece is as trouble for real estate agents with $30 billion, 30 billion potentially leaving the industry. One firm estimates 1.6 million agents could lose their jobs. If you're listening to this and you're a real estate pro, people are really crystal going to begin demanding that you're worth it. Yes. That you actually are worth the money that we're paying you or we're not going to pay you any money. I'll tell you, you know, Doug, when I lived in Michigan for a while, it was weird how when I moved back to Michigan, by the way, Doug decided to move way far away from where I was. <laughs> I felt like there was some like the restraining order was going to get yeah. <laughs> was going to get Just bent. months afterwards. The kind, that timing was weird. But Doug, when we sold that house, I don't know if you remember this, but they were finally redoing the roads in that subdivision that I lived in. And we were going to be on the hook for crystal about twelve thousand dollars worth of work right oh yeah twelve thousand bucks it was the first oh. time this road had been redone in 30 years because it was a subdivision and the way that this community was where i lived that wasn't part of our tax load so we were just going to eat it i had lived there for by the way for less than two years and i'm going to get hit with the first time in 30 years oh, this is happening no. and by the way i'm moving right so it's going to be 12 grand. Well, we put it right in right. the disclosure and my realtor who was really, really super, he completely disclosed it. He said, Hey, new person, whoever buys this house is on the hook for 12 grand of road construction. If you live here for a long time, that's fantastic. We thought it was going to be a negotiating point when the person signed all the stuff saying that they had read all of it. We were just surprised. I remember calling Brian, my realtor, and going, they didn't do one peep about this, you know, <laughs> and all those disclosures of all the stuff. And I don't know about you guys. I read those like crazy, every single one of those. Oh, there's a problem with, you know, mm -hmm. historically been a problem with the water heater. Or there's been an issue, you know, with this other yeah. thing, whatever it might be. And man, it was all in bold, nothing. And Brian goes, I can't believe it. They must really okay. want the house. And it was very competitive. People wanted to live there. So we just thought it was competitive. The woman came back, Doug, two weeks later two weeks. after everything was signed, everything is done. And she's like, what is this I'm hearing about the road construction? And Brian goes, <laughs> it was right in the disclosure. Yeah. Yep. You read it. <laughs> Imagine having her as your agent if you're buying oh, something. Oh, yeah. That's and that phone right. call. Hey, uh, Crystal, guess what? It's going to be $12,000 more than I told you it was going to be. Right. But yeah, we signed everything, saying We read it. Yeah. And by the way, shame on the people buying it too. Clearly, yeah, they didn't read it. I'm guilty of not reading every single line, but this is a lesson for that, reading everything. Down here later, it says startups get new life. I think this is also going to change, Doug. Previously, companies like Purple Bricks and REX offered lower or flat fees to sellers and did not promise to pay the yeah. buyer's agent's commission. 
They were forced to close their doors. REX mm. founder Jack Ryan told the Wall Street Journal, this is going to be a catalyst because nobody could break the cartel before. <laughs> <laughs> I love the cartel. That's a question that I want to dig into that, and I should have maybe beforehand, but it's that word cartel and the <laughs> fact that they couldn't break in that really makes me, well, I mean, that's essentially what, what that organization is. I mean, there's a nefarious kind of <laughs> insinuation around that word, but I want to know why they couldn't break in. Like, why didn't those business, you'd think if it's just straight up, hey, we've got a better mousetrap here and buyers won't have to pay at least part of that fee because our agents are flat fee or whatever hourly, you'd think that would take off, that that would be a very appealing product. So I want to know why they couldn't break in. What was it about what the National Association of Realtors or any other group had that prevented those other companies from succeeding? I think it's the big name and the protection that you feel. I remember years ago, I did a focus group. I was a focus groupie, focus group groupie. Like they used to feed you back in the day. You would get cash for your opinion. <laughs> one time I caught a bus and two trains out to this one place to do the focus group. Oh yeah. No. Only worth my time. You know, now looking back <laughs> was not. <laughs> but... for some cheese whiz on a rinse. <laughs> but this was when... Uh... <laughs> I was going to say, for anybody that couldn't hear the sarcasm in Crystal's no, voice true, right there. This was back when Redfin was trying to get into the market, and they were one of the first people with the flat rate commissions. And all of us were skeptical in that focus group. I think whatever NDA is probably invalid by now. But a lot of us were really skeptical about it. And it's like, you know, this is a home purchase. This is one of the biggest purchases in my life. I want to go with, you know, a realtor in AR, like one of the big names. I don't know you from a can of paint. It just seems fishy. I don't want to just do this all over the internet thing. You know, this was the internet was all new and everything. So they did the focus group. They did the research. And we were just like, I don't know about a flat rate because am I going to get the same level of service if I'm an investor trying to buy a $50,000 home then? You know, my after repair value, if maybe if it's 200000 or even if I'm in the million area, do you really expect the same level of service for a flat fee? I think that's why a lot of the flat fees are like, I don't know about that. You saw this over time, though, happen with airlines, right? I mean, the discount airlines. And then mm. what happened? You didn't get better service from Delta and American. Next thing you know, you get nothing from anybody. But you also saw this the opposite way in the world of certified financial planners. Back in the 90s, I mean, it was all big yeah. businesses. You were going to use a big name and these wingdings that were off working on their own were very few. There weren't that many of them. And now, of course, I think a lot of people now, Crystal, finally look at, look at this a different way. So maybe it's just a matter of time, Doug. Maybe it's now people are going to have to get used to the fact that, you know, maybe working with a smaller firm or a firm that works differently is actually a good thing. Right. It's more intimate too. Maybe they, they're thinking that too. Yeah. Mm. Coming up next, she is a woman who works with people on communication and she also spent time just for fun as an auctioneer. <laughs> she talked about it in a Ted talk. She has a new book out about the topic, but Dia Bondi is a force of nature. And we're about to talk to her now about negotiating because Crystal, you know, mm. We, it turns out, sell ourselves short so, yes. so, so often, and Dia's going to help us there. I know I do. I sell myself short. Like th I'm looking forward to this talk. I didn't realize how much I sold myself short until <laughs> I heard Dia Bondi speak for the first ah. time. Yeah. So strap in, everybody, because we're about to pull over and pick up Dia Bondi. And while we do that, Doug, I think you've got today's pop quiz. Sell yourself short, Joe. You're a tremendous slouch. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Ruth's wrench-wielding repair guru, neighbor Doug. And since we've got a renowned auctioneer about to hop into the backseat of the town car, I thought I'd lean in to learn more about that fascinating profession. I mean, I'm already a great salesman, right? Who else could have sold some blurry painting of water lilies I picked up at a garage sale to some sucker on eBay for 200 bucks? Whoever that Monette dude was that signed it must have just learned how to paint because you could see every 
brush stroke. Wow. Everyone, I mean, that's a hack, Impressive. right? So amateur. And we all know I can talk fast. Check this out. Can I get a 25, 25, bit him on, bit him on 25, bit him on 30, 30, 30, 40. Hey, bit him on 45, 45, bit him on 50. Sold to the woman driving the Chevy Malibu doing her makeup in the stoplight. This stuff's easy. She just bought the chiclets I got in my front pocket. She didn't even know it. Today's trivia question is, who painted the most expensive thing ever sold at auction? I'll be back right after I figure out what else I've got to sell with my new magical powers. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Sales Samurai and Double Talker, Ruth's mechanic neighbor Doug. I've been digging into this auctioneer thing. I really think I've stumbled into my new side hustle, not the least of which is because people call auctioneers colonels. How boss is that? That's because during the American Civil War, the winners of a battle would loot the bodies on the battlefield and then the colonel would auction off all the stuff to the soldiers. Well, I mean, the ones still alive. I just felt like I needed to clarify that. Before the break, I asked you who painted the most expensive thing ever sold at auction. Well, there are less than 20 known surviving paintings by the artist who made the depiction of Christ called Salvatore Mundi, or Savior of the World. Hey, there's something else I got in common with this trivia. Well, anywho, anything with his John Hancock on it's going to pull down some buku bucks. No, it wasn't John Hancock. He only painted signatures. It was actually Leonardo da Vinci. His Salvatore Mundi commanded more than $450 million. And get this, there's a bunch of people who think it's a fake. See, that's more proof that if you can talk really, really fast, people are going to buy anything. Now that I've taught you all I know about becoming an auctioneer, let's see if Dia Bondi has anything to add. And we're super happy to have her here with us, Dia Bondi. Hi, with everybody. Us. How are you? Hi, yes. I'm good. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to be here with you. Well, I got to tell you, you know, you say this whole project, Dia, is about auctioneers. It turns out, like when I open your book, it's really about cake. This is all about cake, which you have me a cake. <laughs> yeah, me too. I know. The whole book, for folks listening, the whole book opens with a story that might feel familiar to folks who are listening, where when we were kids, it was so easy for us to use our ingenuity to sort of figure out who we needed to ask to get what we needed. And our plans might change and what we asked for might change, but the goal is still sort of strong in our hearts and minds. And this whole book or this project, Ask Like an Auctioneer, is really designed to sort of tap into your tiny genius and our tiny geniuses that knew we wanted cake you know, and would end up with candy, but still happy that we got something that felt sweet. I remember these days, though. Something. You right. open up at like the, I don't know if it's a family reunion or the big family picnic. And I remember these days and mom doesn't want you to have Me any too. more cake. You've had enough sugar. And so you and what your cousins, you guys all start conspiring. But what's cool is, and I think this is just a great thing to go through. Like we're going to talk about asking, but first, you've got to have the right people on your team and you got to know who the gatekeepers are. Like, it sounds like uncle, what was his name? Uncle Jim or something like he's your buddy, Dia. hundred percent. I mean, it is a lot about understanding that, you know, okay. So ask like an auctioneer isn't necessarily about negotiation. We talk about negotiation there a little bit, but it is really exactly what you said. It's about using asking as a success strategy. And yes, we do open the book in that, you know, these were like common pool parties we had in our household and with all of our, cousins coming together. And we would use asking as a success strategy. Everybody knows that feeling. You go to mom or you go to dad or you go to your auntie or you go to your grandma and you ask for something and they say no. And it doesn't stop you. You wonder like, okay, who can I ask next? And in that way, you know, we can use asking as a way to forge our way forward, even when we hit roadblocks. But why do you draw the line that this isn't negotiation? Because I think that there's a lot of negotiation there. There is. You have to negotiate with your uncle. You have to negotiate where the hell your mom is so you can slip around her. Yeah, that's fair. You end up Aww. negotiating with grandma good. to get the candy. That's fair, oh, yeah, but I want to focus so often. So, I, you know, I launched Project Ask Like an Auctioneer with a goal to help a million women ask for more and get it as a keynote and workshop like five years ago. And we've been at Google's X team. We've been at Dropbox. We've been at Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. These are black and brown women in the Department of Defense and the White House working on peace policy, all about helping these women use asking as a success strategy in their careers and in their businesses a lot in entrepreneurship as well. And it's very easy for us to think about what should I say next instead of focusing on what are you saying first? 
what are you asking for and how are you designing an ask such that it is the most fruitful, high yield, maximized ask you can possibly make for yourself? And then let's talk about how do you negotiate your way forward after you define that ask. I just feel like there are plenty of books, plenty of projects out there focusing on the negotiation part. I want to really drill in on what is it you're asking for and how are you not preemptively lowballing yourself at that very first moment where we get to be truthful with ourselves about where we see what our limits are and how we can challenge them by shaping an ask that is bigger, bolder, more courageous, and more aligned to what we actually need than we've ever experienced before. I want to talk in a minute about how this whole thing began because it was awesome watching <laughs> watching your TED talk about this topic and just how this came to be asking like an auctioneer. But before that, you know, everybody thinks they got to be something more, Dia. I got to be more or I got to slim it down. I got to be, you're like, no, no, no. You be exactly you. Right at the beginning, before we even start out, this is not about you changing a ton. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. what you're pointing to is this notion that you will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. And it's not about being too much in terms of your big personality, although it could be. It could be about how charismatic you are. It could be about, you know, sort of your outward how people perceive you outwardly. It could be about how you think about shaping up the things that you ask for and who you collaborate with. That if you feel like what you're moving toward isn't being received, this is not an invitation for us to crouch into an uncomfortably small position. It's an invitation to recognize that there just is misalignment, that what matters to you doesn't matter to them misalignment doesn't need to be internalized. So as we think about asking for more and getting it, holding onto the stance gives us permission and space we need to go ahead and move forward with what we want without cowering in the face of possible rejection. Well, and Crystal, as our deeders are building their real estate teams, Dia's advice right there is hugely important because how often do we think it's us, right? Oh, this contractor is a bear to work with, so it must be me. Too often. And then another thing about cowering, like a lot of us too don't recognize when we've outgrown a space, we've outgrown a job, we've outgrown friends, outgrown family. How many times have we cowered down to that instead of, you know, those people aren't for you anymore or aren't for you. And like you said, like we got to grow out of it and stretch out of it. So often we're kind of problem solving for the wrong thing. Now I recognize we don't all operate in a vacuum. Like women specifically are punished for advocating for themselves, particularly black women are punished for advocating for themselves. But the answer can't be play small. I can't have that be the thing. So we do need to, as we go to make big, powerful strategic asks, build a community be a community of mentors and champions around us. We need to let our dreams be known to the communities that we're collaborating with so that when we go to do that big ask, people can see it in the context of what you're trying to do in the world and they can help you get there. It's not about what you're getting. It's about what you're making happen. I remember very early, the very first time you know, when I wrote this book, which is published day before yesterday was our pub day, you know, I kind of open source this stuff. This is how I'll always write books. I recognize, you know, we did it as workshops and keynotes for four years before it turned into a book proposal, before it turned into a book so that I could see what was resonant, what mattered with audiences. The very first time I tested it was 65 women in Silicon Valley. I said, I got 20 minutes to share with you what it means to ask like an auctioneer and your job is to tell me if it works or if it's crap. And of course, everyone in the room raised their hand and said, it works, keep going, and here we are. But there was a woman in the room that raised her hand and said, okay, but this is all great, I wanna do this, but how do I ask so that I'm not seen as, and then fill in the blank? Like anybody listening can fill in the blank. Yeah, whatever, pushy, you know, bossy, greedy, you know, self-centering, selfish, like fill it all in. I knew at that moment I had a choice to say, I could help this woman pretzel herself into a storked, uncomfortable, one-footed position such that she can get what she wants and not possibly run up against any disapproval anywhere and spend a lot of energy worrying about what other people think, or I can decide not to. And I've just decided not to. I'm like, look, if we are asking the right audience at the right time tied to a dream that everyone knows you have for yourself and for the impact that you want to have on the people around you, you are deploying a big, powerful ask into a context that has sense. The math works, okay? Number one. Number two, you will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. And it is okay to be misunderstood by the wrong people. I've got a 
one more thing to set this up, which is I've always, Dia, since the late 1980s, I heard a phrase, which was feel the fear, but do it anyway. And I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of everything. And I have to continually remind myself that you have a different phrase, which I actually, frankly, like better than mine. I've just had mine for so long and you call it Zofo. And life is really finally moving for you. And this is where we're going to get into the guys asking like an auctioneer. What is Zofo? (laughs) Zofo stands for the zone of freaking out, which is where all the asks we make in our life, business, career live because they are (laughs) bigger than what we think we can get a guaranteed yes to. If it's above what you're pretty sure you're going to get a yes to, that ask lives in your zone of freaking out. And here's the thing. The Zofo never goes away. You can think of it like this. If I'm not in my comfort zone, where am I? I'm in my Zofo. And it has that familiar feeling I'm sure everyone listening can recognize. For me, the Zofo feels like I swallowed a cold penny and it's just stuck right below my sternum. For other people, it could be that hot feeling you get in your neck when you go make a big ask or you advocate for yourself in a way that you're not used to. And we can reread that feeling we get, not as a sign that we're really trespassing or breaking anything, you know, the how dare you, who do you think you are story, but we can take that combination of thrill and fright and reread that feeling as a sign you're actually standing up for yourself and that you're being courageous and that you're challenging your own assumptions about what's possible. I think of the Zofo, the zone of freaking out is also the zone of potential because we don't know what could happen. We might be making an ask that, you know, can surprise us. Well, and that's the thing too, that I loved about your book is, you know, it comes with worksheets, you know, and prompts to really reflect on a lot of different things. And when I was going through my Zofo, a lot of times you notice after, even if you get a no from your Zofo moment, it wasn't that scary. It wasn't the end of the world. And it got you closer to what you really wanted in the first place. And so that's another like realization I liked about it is like, you know, that wasn't as scary as I made it out to be. Yeah, it goes from like a negative scary to kind of a thrilling scary, you know, and our Zophos grow with us. Look, when I first was starting out in my communications practice, I've been a longtime leadership communications coach. I never would have thought that I'd be working on contracts that have as many zeros as they have on them now. Like, you know, but I still have a Zofo. When I write a proposal or I go for that big client, I'm going to launch a few things this year that feel Zofo-ish for me. But I know it's a sign. Again, I'm rereading that feeling that it's a sign. I'm kind of standing up for my dreams for myself. And it grows with us. Our Zofos are like the horizon. You run toward them and they just move away from you. And that's okay. Crystal, it's funny, Dee. I'm going to talk to Crystal here for a second. But what amazes me about this conversation is, You hear one expert that you talk to who says something, and it might be their quirky thing. It might be their deal. But then you start hearing these people that are geniuses who have this same, 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 and you start to kind of get the Milky Way, right? This is where things are really lining up. The stars are lining up. This sounds crystal like our interview with Vicki Barron, who, Dia, is one of the top real estate people in the United States. She consistently is living in Zofo land. She Mm -hmm. would ask questions of people all the time. She would put deals on the table. Remember that one deal, Crystal? She had no business asking for that deal. And she told the guy, she goes, here's what I'd like to have happen. And Dia, she just threw it out there. She goes, what I'd like to have happen is I can't afford this house, but I love this house. I think I would be so good to this property. I think it'd be great, but I can't afford it. What can you do to help me make this happen? And guess what happened, Dia? The deal happened. Don't have to tell me the house that my husband and I live in right now, which is sort of our dream space in the Bay Area happened because my husband reminded me that because I made a Zofo ask before I even had the language of what the Zofo was, we made an offer that was all the money we had. And they said, you know, are you kidding me? And we said, no, we're not. This is all the money we have. They said, take it packing lady. Like 25, 30 days later, they came back (laughs) and said, okay, renew your offer, remove all contingencies except the loan contingency, which we were comfortable doing because it was our fourth home. We're not afraid of a little bit of, you know, run of the mill mold. We know how to take sheetrock down and put it back, you know? And we landed that home. This is a big, what I want to point to on that is like, yes, 
like Zofo mm-hmm. asks are the kinds of asks that can change everything for us. Mm-hmm. Not every ask you make in your life, career, and business is a Zofo ask. Some of them are just, please pass the salt. Hey, can I get, you know, a few more hours of your time? Like they're not all adrenaline filled, you know, Zofo mm-hmm. asks, but the ones that have the potential to change everything are. Now, one thing that's really critical is that the Zofo ask means that you could get a no. Okay. You could, that's what makes it Zofo ish. And you could, in some cases, get a hard <laughs> no, like my husband and I did in that example 15 years ago, but there is something called the boomerang effect, which is to say, these people can say no, and they may come back in a month, 12 months, 18 months collaborators in our lives, Hmm. customers we work with, clients that we might engage with. And we want to make sure that we're coming at these ask moments with integrity and empathy and generosity without making ourselves small because you just never know. Well, let's get to the heart of this with Dia Crystal, which is (laughs) talk about Zomo. (laughs) When the hell did you decide to become an auctioneer? Like where did, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and do auction classes. Definitely. Cause that would be in my Zomo. Yeah. That would totally be. Zofo. Zofo, Zomo, yes, Zo, go, Zo, <laughs> yeah. no, no, Zo, um, no, no, no. Let's do that. <laughs> so I've been a leadership communications coach for many, many years. I went on sort of a working sabbatical and that 18 months I did the artist's way end to end folks who are listening might be interested in what that is beautiful way to sort of move your way back towards your creativity and sort of what lights you up. Even if you're not an artist or a writer, I got the best shape of my life. And in that time I was like, while I was doing pull-ups and doing journal entries for the artist's way, I was like, I want to do something weird and interesting. I like learning stuff that's outside of my domain. You know, I like taking, I took a class in spiritual will writing, which is very interesting and wonderful. And I always find a way to draw these things back Hmm. into my communications work. And my husband said during that sabbatical, Hey, remember that thing that you said you'd do, which was auctioneering school 15 years before 12 years before my kids were in a preschool co-op and we had an annual fundraiser and all the mommies and daddies and caregivers that were involved in running that fundraiser and the school were like, I'm not getting on the mic. Do you, you get on the mic? Cause I'm, you know, I've been facilitating <laughs> workshops and speaking for you. It's a comfortable place for me to be. I didn't know. So they said, Dia, be the auctioneer. And I was like, this was at a time where even, you know, now you can learn anything on YouTube and it wasn't so robust at that time. So I just kind of faked it and did it and had so much fun. And a couple of weeks later, I'm at dinner and we were all talking about bucket list stuff, right? I know the story's going on. I promise I'm going to get to it. No, this is good. (laughs) Yeah. We had gone around the table. You know what I would do? You know what I would do? I'd want to travel here. I'd want to travel there. I want to learn this. I'd want to learn that. And I said, you know what I would do? I'd actually learn how to auctioneer for real. Well, fast forward to my, you know, eight years later to my sabbatical, my husband reminded me of that sort of threat I'd made. And I was like, oh, yeah. So I Googled around and like, there's a thing called auctioneering school. And so I got on an airplane and me and a hundred cowboys learned how to auctioneer just about everything. And these guys were there for, you know, real estate auctions for sure, but also like cattle auctions and, you know, people, we learned of everything like garage sale auctions. You're selling things starting at a dollar, you know? And when I got home, I was like, what am I doing with it? I'm not going to use it as a career, but I was like, oh, I know I'm really interested and active in the world of advancing women in careers and entrepreneurship. And I was like, I will do it as an impact hobby in the San Francisco Bay area for women-led nonprofits and nonprofits Mm -hmm. benefiting women and girls. It makes sense to me. Again, the math worked for me. And so I connected with a local auctioneering agency here actually that had gigs and would pass them to me. I I mean, I, we charged the tiniest bit for my service. I mean, I didn't even care about making the money. It was just an opportunity to, to start auctioneering quickly. And um, 20 auctions later, I realized, oh my gosh, everybody I work with, you know, around my communications work could really benefit from what I was learning. And I was not going to start an auctioneering school for girls. Instead, I launched Project Ask Like an Auctioneer to share what I learned in front of the room. Wow. You never know. If you have a curiosity about something you want to learn or experience, and you can afford it in terms of time and attention and spirit, do it. Even if it doesn't have an obvious upside, because you just never know what it'll spark for you. And I think that's the key. One of my longtime beliefs, and I never put this together as brilliantly as the guy I'm going to quote did. When I read Austin Kleon, Steal Like an Artist, Dia, 
it just resonated with me because stealing like an artist, taking thing from over here and moving it over here and taking that, like my favorite thing is to go to podcast. There's a podcast conference called podcast movement. And I'm learning from comedians and I'm learning from NPR people. I'm learning from sports people stuff about financial shows, you know, because financial shows generally aren't good storytellers. And you learn that from storytelling mm -hmm. people and just <laughs> that synapse of what you learned at auctioneer school being so big. Give us, though, it very, very, very bluntly, what can real estate investors learn most from auctioneers? Well, I don't know how a real estate investor might deploy this into the asks that they make, but the core idea of what it means to ask like an auctioneer is to ask in order to get a no, because if you get the no and negotiate down, you know you will be sure you've left no money or opportunity on the table. That's the number one lesson. If you want to know that you have not accidentally lowballed yourself, you are going to aim for a no intentionally. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I like just because it's almost cheating yourself too, because I know going back to what we were talking about earlier, I had an interview. I thought I wowed them because you do say, I like that you say, arm your asks with what they need so they become the most powerful version possible. So you're telling them how your ask is actually helping them. So, yes. you know, or you're explaining, you know, why you arrived at your ask in the first place. Yeah. And actually that quote you're pointing to, there's two ideas. One is I don't want women to feel like they should ask or that there's something wrong with them if they don't. I want to say, if you want to use asking as a success strategy, I want you to arm your little asks like they were your children or your favorite <laughs> niece with the best possible tools so that they can be their biggest and best thing in the world. So think about you empowering your own ask, not yourself. You are already empowered. You're sitting right here. You got all the things you need. But there's a second idea in there, which is that there is an offer inside every ask you make. One of the things I learned auctioneering was that sometimes I'd have to stand in front of the room and just ask for direct pledges. We weren't even selling anything. And I'm like, what's the story here? Like, what is it that these people want if they're just going to raise their paddle and give me 20 grand, 10 grand, five grand, or, you know, I say every dollar is a hero dollar. Like if they're going to give me 20 bucks tonight to support, you know, women going through breast cancer at a low income level so that they don't get the lights shut off while they're in treatment or, you know, funding camps for autistic kids of low income families. So parents can get a respite, like on and on. Right. So I had to get really clear. What's the offer inside of this ask? I'm going to ask you for five grand, what are you getting? You're getting an opportunity to live and pledge in alignment with your values. You're getting an opportunity to participate in a collective act of generosity with people in your very own community and build connections around that. Tonight, if you buy a piece of art, you are going to officially be able to call yourself a collector. How fun. So understanding the offer inside of your ask, and I want to answer, Joe, your question a little bit more directly. You know, when we think about real estate investing as an outsider, I think about like buying and selling properties buying and renting properties, buying and leasing properties, fine. But I want people to apply this idea to so much more than just money asks. You know, we are not successful in our lives and businesses alone. So if you need to find deals that are off market, how might you grow your network of influential voices who have their ear to the ground such that you are a trusted partner and they'll want to feed you deals. So those are the kinds of asks that elevate your own visibility and influence in a particular market. Maybe it's about authority. How do you become a trusted authority in your community such that when you put a deal forward, they're more likely to say yes to you, even if you're making the big ask, which could be a big dollar amount or a small dollar amount and balance. How do you, how do you act and make the asks that you need in your own business and career that let you bring into balance who you are and the kind of work, the kind of investment, the kind of projects you want to be working on every single day. So I don't want this to be just focused on the kinds of strategic asks we make that are tied to money. But it all leads to just a better life, Dia, I think, because, man, if you can ask for that mentorship help, which I think is part of what you're alluding to for all of our deeders. Turns into dollars. Yeah. Not just dollars, but wonderful experiences. I mean, my son gets a lot of help. He invests in real estate in Detroit. He wants to be a part of the rebirth of Detroit. So he owns yeah. 14 rental yeah. houses there. And he's excited about being wonderful. in these communities, being a force for good. It just, yeah. I've seen there's a trend around 
and tell me if I'm wrong, just around folks buying abandoned small family owned motels and turning them into single room, you know, low income rental properties for folks and communities that would otherwise not have access to that housing. Like what an asset you are to your community when you engage in that way. And then how do you, I wonder yes. if that was inspired so, by Shit's yeah. Creek. I'm just, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I That's wonder. Funny. Well, and then this also goes back to, to something you, um, a phrase you said earlier, Dia, and something in the book that ask that changes everything. Will you teach me? And then what you said earlier was, yeah. Hey, can I get a little bit more of your time? That's how you change communities is you're in the community and you have a mentor or you have like the local, you know, aldermen, politicians, like you need to build relationships with all these people. And how do you do it? You ask. Yeah. And this is Crystal, actually a great place to use as our last question, because uh, D, I had the same question. This is personal for you, Crystal, what you're alluding to. Like this isn't just all whatever. You had a big ask in your a Zofo moment for you that really changed your life. I did. And again, this is stuff that, you know, we can all look backwards and notice the asks we've made in our lives that changed everything. And we can reproduce this experience. We can every day. I mean, my husband reminded me like, Dia, you think you launched this as a new idea. You've been doing this your whole life. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And he reminded me, yes, I made one ask mm -hmm. that changed everything. My husband and I were married pretty young. I was really floundering about what I wanted to do with my career. And I found somebody who was doing work that once I saw him doing that work, it was around facilitating learning in a corporate environment around communications and helping leaders speak powerfully. And I was so shocked and compelled by the work when he let me sit in the back of the classroom and watch him work. I mean, I say classroom, but it's, you know, it's a professional development context. And I never wanted something so bad in my life. I mean, I saw it and I was like, if I don't get to do this work, I'm going to die. Like, I have to find a way. And I was so unqualified. I was qualified in that I had the drive. I had the desire to be a strong and powerful facilitator. I had grown up in the world of, you know, my early working days were, you know, as a fitness instructor. So I was used to being in front of the room with a mic on my head, talking to 50, 60, you know, people at a time. When I saw that work, I knew I was going to make an ask of him. And I had to spend some time figuring out what that was. But at this point, Dia, at this point, and just to be clear for all our deeders, you're about to make the ask. This is where most of us suffer from that. What do they call it? The imposter syndrome, right? And oh, we're like, I'm unqualified. Yeah. I can't do it. You know what? That's a dream. I'm going to let it go. Well, what I recognize that I wasn't asking him for a job. I wasn't asking him for a job. What I really mm -hmm. understood in that moment, and this was the ask, everybody, it was not about money. It was about his time and attention and investment in me. And I knew that the ask was, will you teach me? And the offer inside of that ask was an opportunity for him to mentor somebody meaningfully, for him to have an apprentice, to pass on his ideas and practices through to the next generation, for him to expand his own impact through mm -hmm. me. Because if he taught me, I could be out in the world teaching his work you know, on his behalf all over the globe. I got to end up getting to travel all over the world. So there was something in it nice. for him, so to speak. And if I could demonstrate simultaneous to me asking for something that felt way bigger than my britches with being able to articulate what mattered to him in the same breath, my chances of getting a yes, even though I was sure he was going to say no. And I aimed for that no. I was willing to be rejected. It was a pretty good bet. And I aimed for that no. I ended up getting a yes. And the next thing I knew, I was on an airplane in New uh -huh. York. That's life-changing. Life-changing. Mm -hmm. The book is called Ask Like an Auctioneer, How to Ask for More and Get It. And as uh, you just said earlier, Dia, it's available everywhere. Yay. It is. And on audiobook, I read the book. And oh. I hope that as you read it, Crystal and Joe, you had some fun with it. You know, I recognize in so many yes. books in the nonfiction section really can read like a Wikipedia page. And I hope this one did not. I really tried to make sure that it would be <laughs> fun for everyone to leave and have an aliveness in it that I hope you can experience when you go use these ideas out in your own world, in your own life, in your own career. Yeah, it helped me. Yeah, I'm getting rid of the, you know, they're just probably going to say no. Like we all need to just remove that thinking in the first place. I said that today inside of our Stacking Benjamins team, we were having a discussion about something that will help our deeders and our stackers do better stuff. And it's a big thing. And Stacy on our team was like, maybe we should try to get this done by the end of the year. 
And I said, oh, man, I don't know. And then I thought of you and I thought about Zofo See? and I went, you know, maybe we should. <laughs> but then I also said, I'm like, hey, if we miss, you know, I didn't want to put too much pressure on my team. If we miss, we miss. But we you know what? Progress. Let's set the bar high. Let's do it. And Stacy goes, yeah, let's do it. Like our team's fired up because of you, Dia. So thank you so much for mentoring all of us. So happy to hear how this kind of these yes. ideas, we can twist them into what works in our own contexts and make them because I, you know, I say in the book and I think it's true that these ideas work best when you make them work for you. That's a great last word. We're going to end on that. Oh my God. Was that fun? Big thanks to Dia for joining us. And Crystal, how many times have you thought to yourself, Oh, that's a good enough deal for me. And if you would have just asked again until you got to know, it would have been a different turn. Listen, there's been so many times I'm like, oh, sucker. He said yes to my price. <laughs> totally not knowing that I was totally screwed. So this changes the game. This changes everything. I'm just going to keep digging, digging, digging. Because you think you're being like a jerk, especially like the bodegas, like why travel internationally. I pay the right. price, they say. Totally didn't know you can haggle. So you think people are pushy that haggle, but no, they get what they want or they get the best deal. Well, and it doesn't have to be confrontational. Right. I think we think it's, you know, when you say I'm being a jerk, mm -hmm. it's because you think you're creating confrontation. But to her point, with an auctioneer, you just yes. go till everybody says no. <laughs> you're right. You are right about that. <laughs> the three of us are Midwest nice, though. If one of us was from care. New York... It would be well. Normally, be at this juncture, we have a call to Ruth's rotary phone. However, <laughs> we have a note here from listener Jewel. Jewel Crystal has some discrepancies with something I said about an insurance company a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. All right, I can read that. Let's see. So, this is from Jewel Robinson. First of all, thank you, Jewel, for writing in to us. We love hearing from our listeners. Okay, so, and we love- it on the windshield, like, <laughs> nice parking jerk. That's what you thought the note was going to be, and then you- <laughs> Oh, yeah, I lightened up well. now, lightened up. <laughs> totally different attitude now. Just an FYI for Joe, as I heard him talking about Allstate insurance. I just want him to know we were with Allstate for auto and homeowners for 35 years, and there was a missed payment because my credit card expired, and I didn't realize the payment was tied to this card. So the broker never sent me an email, never called, and no notice at all from Allstate. We were hit by another driver, no injuries, fortunately. Glad there were no injuries. But there was damage to the vehicle, and since the payment had been missed, and I discovered it the day before the reinstatement date, and I made a payment online because no one was answering the phone at the broker's office. Since this was late on a Friday afternoon, and of course they were closed till Monday, they refused to accept the payment for reinstatement. And I just couldn't believe that they would treat us like that after being loyal customers for over 35 years. So I'm definitely not recommending Allstate to anyone. Oh, that's a quite the conundrum. Well, I'm glad she brought that up because, you know, when you get to the level of an Allstate, the problem is, is it's so agent dependent. Allstate is less of a Allstate's good or bad, Crystal, as it is. We have all these agents. You hope they would all be uniform and they are not. They're not all uniform. On Allstate's part, as a company, like their home office, if the home office hours are already closed and the agent hasn't done their job, I think your big issue is with the neglect of your agent. And that's the first place I would start is with agent neglected this agent caused this problem. I mean, if you're thinking about keeping that relationship alive, I think the thing I'm hearing loud and clear here before I get to really why there's a lesson here that might be different than the one that Jewel got is that if you're going to go with a company that has agents, you really need to do a good job of interviewing that agent and making sure that it's because I think too often when it comes to a company like State Farm, as an example, which is very agent based, Allstate, which is very agent based, your whole experience of that company is going to be based on that agent. And so, you know, I mean, State Farm and their commercials, right, to switch companies here for a minute, what do they do? They talk about how great the Jake from State Farm. And the reason is, is they say their agents are strong. If you get a State Farm agent who isn't strong, who isn't actually helping you with anything, you're overpaying. State Farm doesn't want me to tell you that, but I'll tell you that you can easily beat State Farm's premiums 
with a company that doesn't have agents. So that's number one. The issue here is so because Allstate mm -hmm. is beholden to their agents, that's how they've decided to set up their work. This is where Allstate created the frustration. They cannot violate their contract. This is literally an insurance contract. And because of that, if State Farm's corporate office closes at five and you want to submit your payment at six, the contract is it's going to be during the working hours. And Crystal, and this is where it's a bummer for Jewel. They can't violate that contract. If they do violate that contract for Jewel, then they're on the hook for everybody else. And they're regulated by the individual states who hold them accountable to keep up the contract. So does all state have a problem here? Yeah, they've got agents who suck. It isn't the thing that Jewel wants to hear that they're not training their agents. She wants them to give them reinstatement after the close of the contract. Agents should have noticed, but all state really, their hands are tied in terms of, so the only piece of this that I get frustrated with that I wish there was something all state could do, but they can't. She goes, we've been with them for 35 years and they treat us this way. All states treating your contract exactly like they treat every other contract. Your agent screwed right. this up. Yeah. I mean, the agents all get paid on commission for the premiums that get paid. So you'd think if they had a good process and system set up in their office to figure out what's our revenue and is everybody paying their stuff? Cause I want part of that. Then they would have noticed that somebody didn't pay. Like that's a great service brand, that your agent should brand. be doing on your behalf, but mostly there's some self-interest there because they want whatever small percentages of your mm -hmm. premium that you should be paying. Absolutely. Yeah. But your agent systems are, and now does that ultimately fall on Allstate? Sure. Cause Jewel doesn't think that it's just the yeah. agent it's, you know, Allstate not training their people as well to be better or letting them still exist. Right. And maybe she needs to put pressure on Allstate, but it should all be directed to the agent <laughs> and how the agent messed this up. Sorry to hear about that, Jewel. And I hear that loud and clear. Very luckily, I have a very good agent who oh. they contact me, not an annoying amount, but about three times a year. And here's what's cool, Crystal. Nice. My agent, a guy named Scott, has such great systems. I don't even talk to Scott. Jackie is the person that works for the agent. She knows so much about homeowners and insurances that Jackie and I have had these phenomenal right. conversations a few times a year about, well, you know, what about this going on? What about this going on? And okay. make sure that, and you know, what's cool. They're not long conversations, but I also know that Jackie and Scott are not going to drop the ball for me again, agent dependent with all state. I'd say cool just experience. generally guys, that's been my feeling about all state. Yeah. For the last 30 years has been that all state is hugely agent dependent state farm, much less so state farm. I feel like has much more of a you go with State Farm, they're betting so much that their agents are going to rock that State Farm agents more often than not are just absolutely phenomenal. However, you're going to see it in your premium, you know, yeah. if you're buying State Farm, I know they talk about low prices, State everywhere. Farm. I've never seen it. Listen, yes. Knock on State Farm's door. If anybody knows. Uh... That's right. That's right. Why well, no great thing. Crystal, they could have you and I for a lot less money. We should maybe. Exactly. Let's do it. Let's be their celebrity on air talent. We could be their on air. They got to pay for Patrick Mahomes somehow. I know. Exactly. And Crystal, we haven't gotten to know yet with them. So we'd only cost a few million dollars. I mean, come on. Yeah. Thanks for the note, Jewel. If people want to, though, please call Ruth Rotary. What's the number? How do people get there, Crystal? Yeah. Head on over to Stacking Deeds dot net slash voicemail we can hear your lovely voice on camera or well not on camera but on radio or you can just leave us a note <laughs> just like jewel did and then we will answer your question on air all right crystal what do we do to wrap this up oh show notes you've got the show notes ah uh, duh yes so Head to slack stacking. We have, we have no idea. <laughs> we just met. Have today. you guys done this before? <laughs> so head to stackingdeeds.net slash show notes. You will get an awesome synopsis written by yours truly with some great points, takeaways. Sometimes I add funny little notes in there. I do refer to myself in the third person sometimes. So join us to get the show notes. And then going back to Doug's trivia, you guys don't put makeup on when you're at the stoplights in the car. I thought everybody did that. No, no, 
nothing. Well, it's funny. Yeah. Not as much as I used to. <laughs> Not as much as you used to. Because I remember our driver's ed teacher was like, why do people dig in their noses in cars? And I was like, oh, I know this because they think we can't see them. And he's like, no, you have the best mirrors in your car. You can see everything. So you can see clear up your oh. nose in the car. Yeah. And all that <laughs> stuff hanging. All so, Hey. <laughs> this took an awkward turn that I wasn't expecting. And that's why Crystal picks her nose in the car. <laughs> no, <laughs> there are no boogers under my seat. Oh man! I oh, oh no. God. Did you feel an even roost sped up on that one? <laughs> Holy cow! No, well, let's bring Mike let's bring this out. thing home. <laughs> She's Crystal. I'm Joe. We'll see you next time back here on Stacking Deeds, Doug. Well, based on what we did today, let's do this instead of what should we have learned. What's our to do list? Okay, well, Joe, first, use this from Dia Bondi. Keep negotiating until you reach no. Only then are you at the actual price of the thing or service you're after. Second, ask this question based on our headline, how much is the commission you're being asked for and how is it covered in our agreement? It's one little question that could save you huge money. <laughs> the big lesson, the true Da Vinci in this room is probably me. <laughs> I'm the one setting the tone for this whole podcast. I mean, check out that open I did today. It was incredible. The inflection, <laughs> the mood creation, just really fine. All right, do the credits. Oh my God. Can I do them really fast? Suck the fun out of this room, Joe. Thanks to Dia Bondi for joining us today. You can find her new book, Ask Like an Auctioneer, How to Ask for More and Get It Wherever Books Are Sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.net. See, I can do it. It was stackingdeeds.net. You couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs>